All right, I think uh, I think we'll get started. Um, this is a panel for your best game ever. Uh, your best game ever is a, uh, a book that has just come out. Um, it, you can get it at the Monty Cook Games booth uh, down in the exhibit hall. Uh, this is a book that uh, I have been I've been kind of pondering and thinking about for a very very long time. It is system agnostic. It, it, there are no game rules. There's no setting. There's not, not, that's not that kind of a book. Uh, instead, it's a book about role playing and about being a game master, being a player, being a host of a game, being a guest in somebody else's house when you're playing a game. All the things that kind of surround the mechanics and the dragons and the works and um so uh i'm monty cook uh, uh and uh with me here are four of the contributors of to this book because uh one of the great things about this book is that we got a bunch of great contr contributions from people uh essays we got uh, uh some some uh, cartoon strips and comic strips uh from some great web comics uh and it's, uh, we're very, very proud of this book. Um, so uh, let's start here. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Eric Campbell. I was the director of development for a channel called Geek and Sundry for three years. Uh, I hosted a show called Shield of Tomorrow and uh, currently in the middle of doing a season of Callisto 6, which is on the Cypher system. Um, yeah, and that is, that is who I am. <laughs> I'm Vicki Lee. I do a weekly webcomic about my four real-life dogs playing Dungeons & Dragons called Dean Doggos. <laughs> hey everybody, I'm Alina Peet. Uh, I do a webcomic called Wear Geek. That's about the group of gamers having fun playing a bunch of different role-playing systems, uh, including LARPs. Uh, and I did a comic for the book. Uh, hi, I'm Susan J. Morris. I'm an editor and uh, author of four middle grade books. I also design D&D for kids. And I play in his Invisible Sun game, mm -hmm. and then I also run an Invisible Sun game. <laughs> so let's um, let's start off with you know this is a book about uh, you know tips for for everybody whether you are just starting out you have never played a role playing game before or whether you've been playing for. 40 years like me, um, and uh, you know, hopefully there is something in this book for you. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of experience from a lot of different people that, that come in this book. So I thought what we would do is we would just um, have everybody here just give like a tip, right, uh, that to make your game better, right? Whether it be from the player's point of view, the GM's point of view, whatever you want to do. What what? Uh, and we're going to start with Susan. And uh, just what, 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 what's your tip? Uh, so I was thinking about this. I'm not going to do the essay tip. I'm going to okay. do a different tip. Okay. So uh, I think the tip that I would give is learning to recognize where the balls of energy are going in your game. And so as a, and this is kind of a both sides tip. As a GM, you're throwing balls at your players every time you, uh, you set the scene, you set characters, you set plot hooks, like, or you're always throwing them energy or throwing them. And so they will grab onto some of those balls and run with them, and that forms your story. And so part of it is, as a GM, is learning to give balls to all your players, not just one of them. And also learning to, sh like, if a player is like rejecting like five balls you're throwing at them, and they finally catch one, but they think it's a different shape, make it a triangle. If they wanted a triangle, it can be a triangle ball, and run with that. <laughs> but then on the player side, the idea is learning to recognize when someone's throwing a ball at you and catching it and running with it. So if someone throws a plot hook and it, it resonates with any of your threads, that's for you. And so lean into it. You make the interesting decisions. Choose to um, to pursue that. Like engage with that plot line. On the other hand, if it's a th clearly throwing a ball to her, it's my job to make sure I don't take it and that I clear the space for her to take it and run with it so that uh, I do whatever I can to make sure she gets to shine. So it's about making sure everyone has time to shine and recognizing where the flow of the game is going. Yeah, totally agreed. <laughs> uh, I guess I had a build off of that one because um, I was going to say that, uh, so I did a lot of LARP. Um, I actually LARPed before I tabletopped, which is sort of a strange way to come into gaming. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was big into improv in high school. Uh, and from that, you kind of bring the rule of yes into your gaming where both as a player and as a DM, you want to say, okay, yes, yes, you're throwing me a thing, I want to jump in on that, uh, and not go, no, my character wouldn't do that, or, or you know, no, no, I, I don't, that's not a, something that I'm interested in, in, in gaming. Uh, but it is interesting to know that sometimes you can say no to a plot and go, like, I don't feel comfortable about that plot, uh, so I would like to take it somewhere else. 
Um, and uh, an extension of that is also the yes but. So as a DM, you can go, to go okay, you know, I, this challenge was quite easy, but I'm going to throw a complication in just so we keep the story going and keep the challenges uh, there. Uh, same thing with no but. So no, you don't manage to open the door, but you do notice there's a tiny crack in the wall, and maybe you can weaken that. So just cool. always trying to extend a, a branch for somebody to keep the story going. Mm. I think that's great. I think, you know, just trying new things, trying to have fun, and getting into your character. Who is your character? And do they have a fun voice? Do they talk like this? <laughs> you know, like, try something new. Try to figure out who they are and what kind of things they might be interested in doing. That maybe is even something that you wouldn't normally do. Like, finding a crack in the wall. Like, are you going to be able to notice that, or would your character do it? Um, I always, I always kind of fall back onto one of my one of my favorite things to tell any new player or GM is just to don't lose sight of the fact that you're there to play, mm -hmm. and that that's translated into an RPG now, and you got rules and characters and stuff. But it's the same action you're taking at the table that you took when you were a kid on the playground playing tag. It's the same spirit that's bringing you all together to do that, and I think just. Keeping that in mind and letting that inform your game and what you get, you're doing, it's not that difficult. Just don't lose sight of it. Because that's, I think, how a lot of conflict gets resolved at the table when you all just kind of keep it lighthearted. Like, it's a play that's played seriously. Think of it like that. And I, I, always, I always encourage everybody that my, my number one tip is never to forget that you're sort of indulging in an act of play that you've, you know, it's now translated as an, a, into this, like, sort of more of an adult form, I suppose. Um, but it's not a lot of different than banging your G.I. Joes together in the middle of a big fight, you know what I mean? Um, and and I, I think it's important that acknowledging that and realizing that, it's, that this is that everyone's here to have fun and, and just don't lose sight of that, whatever happens. No matter how dark or, or, or deep you guys get into character exploration or the emotionality of like your characters and stuff like that, just don't lose sight of the reason why you're at the table. Yeah. So now what I would like to do is make things a little more difficult. <laughs> and uh, I'd like you all to think about uh, something that's happened to you when you've been gaming, whether you were the GM, whether you were a player, and it's something that you saw somebody do, a, a GM or another player or, or, or whatever, that you thought, that, that was cool, I'm going to try to remember that. Mm. And, and whether it's be a technique, a cool idea, or whatever. Um, and Eric, I'm gonna throw it back at you. Oh man, I was like, oh, I hope he starts leaving into the table. <laughs> um, I've been I've been really lucky um, because I I get to play with a bunch of people. The, the people that come through GNS are are just they're brilliant, like wonderful people who uh, love just throwing themselves into the imaginary circumstance of a game. Um, and uh, I'm fortunate that they are very open to be emotionally vulnerable at the table. Uh, that's not always the right fit for every gaming group, but um, I think my ex <laughs> it's funny because my experience, at least starting from the GNS side, when I started running games, my first game at Geek and Sundry was Doctor Who, and we ran that for like six months, seven months, a short, short campaign compared to what we've been doing since. But there was a moment in that game when I was trying to sort of evoke this sense of... Uh, uh, like I, I wanted to get an emotional investment out of my players, and Amy Dallin at the time was the doctor, and she didn't know she'd been sucked into this alternate universe. She also didn't know that this alternate universe was the universe that her previous regeneration had left Rose in at Bad Wolf Bay. So there was this moment where she uh, was running to, to find, uh, she was tracking the signal, and she was running to find where this was coming from, and she discovered Rose, and then I described the alternate version, David Tennant coming out with a baby in his hands, and Amy lost it at the table, like screeched, high-pitched screech at the table, and there's this huge like ripple effect reaction down, and the entire energy of the table shifted dramatically. It was at that moment that, I mean, I've, I've run a lot of games. I've never had such an emotional reaction from my players before. Um, and it, what was interesting about that particular moment of the game is it suddenly shifted everything in the game because everyone gave each other permission suddenly to have that level of an emotional reaction to stuff. And we were off to the races at that point. Like once it was okay to be ridiculous as it were. And like, <laughs> oh my God, like that game, th those, those players gave me more than I could have ever hoped for. Um, that was a great moment where someone just allowed themselves to just flip a table. <laughs> it, was, it was great, yeah. So I've only been a player. I haven't had a chance to run my own game except for the game that I run for the dogs in the comic. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think that 
my brother is our dungeon master, and one time he had our uh, his wife actually her character's family in the game um, had been killed, and we were on our way to find her other family, which was kidnapped. And she had a very tragic backstory. <laughs> and, uh, we came across a necromancer's lair, and we realized that some of the zombies that he had uh, re reborn uh, were her murdered family. <laughs> and the reaction that we all had when we realized that was just like, oh my god, oh my god, it's her family, and she's like emotional, I'm emotional because she's emotional, and then we had a mercy kill them, which was even worse. <laughs> and I, I keep my comic very, very G, PG, you know, but something like that, to be able to do that to the players and get that, that's what, oh, yeah. when I, when I get finally DM, that's what I want to do. <laughs> I have a tough time seeing the dogs do that in the comic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that little, I like to keep it nice. <laughs> they're so cute. Yeah, no, they're, they're nice dogs. <laughs> Um, I think one of the scariest role-playing moments I ever had was uh, a friend's Don't Rest Your Head game. Uh, and he, he was really good about sort of making it immersive and making it interactive. So we, one game we came in and he had put red filters over the lights in, all the, in the room. So it was just this like red room and we had little flashlights so you could see your character sheet if you needed to. Uh, and then he'd have music and sound effects and other things. But there was one day where we were actually playing on campus. And uh, so our campus club rooms were down in the steam tunnels of our university. <laughs> uh, and there was all these weird rooms off it, and he knew the place really well. So he went, there was one point where we were like exploring this elevator in an office building where we knew that the bad guy was hiding. We were all pretty tense in game, and he went, let's LARP this now. And so we stood up and we walked <laughs> down the hallway to this one back corner where there was just a brick wall with a tiny door, like a half size door. And we had to open the door and none of us could open the door because we were too terrified. <laughs> and that game was so like immersive and in involved that uh, walking back to my apartment, the streetlight flickered and went off and I screamed. <laughs> How about you, Susan? Hmm, it's hard to choose. So in terms of impact in my personal gaming, uh, it's not a very long story, but I think that the most interesting story I have is actually uh, Shauna when she picked the Fall from Grace arc uh, in the beginning of our campaign which um, basically she chose to have a character whose goal was to go from someone who is you know doing well and not fallen from grace and fail and do and you know fall from grace and seeing her embrace that and lean into bad decisions and uh, doing things that you could see as a player were going to like give the GM so many opportunities <laughs> to cause her pain. <laughs> and then seeing it, like her lean into that as a character afterwards and like have that emotional reaction, have that uh, fallout as a character where she tried to go for redemption and she had to struggle and like realizing that you don't always have to make optimal decisions in games, that you can make decisions that are interesting because there was so much story there we never would have gotten if she'd been smart and been like, you know, you know what devil, maybe not, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> So I think that was probably the most impactful. It's really changed the way I play. Cool. So, speaking of failure, what's a time when you, again, player, GM, doesn't matter, were <coughs> wanted to do something, right? You had a, I, I don't mean that, I don't mean your character wanted to do something necessarily, unless that's, unless that's a part of it too, but I just mean, like as a player, as a GM, you were trying to do X and you failed, right? That you just, you know, it was a mood you were trying to establish or something and it just didn't work. And then what did you learn from that and that, that you were able to take forward? And uh, let's start in them. Or, you're nodding your head, I'm gonna go with you. Yeah, I actually, I actually got this one. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so when we were gonna do Star Trek, on Geek and Sundry, I, I remember having a conversation with Matt Colville because Matt had previously worked on the Decipher books ages ago. And I told him we were gonna run this Star Trek RPG, it's gonna be a lot of fun. And I'll never forget, Colville shook his head and he's like, it's not gonna work. <laughs> and I was like, well, why is that? And he's like, because players don't like having, like having another player who has rank over them. And everyone has to be lawful good and everyone has a different idea of what the hell lawful good is. <laughs> and so, uh, to his credit, that is exactly what happened. Um, 
uh, we discovered uh, that there's a whole new group dynamic. Like, I, I really, like, I thought we were all coming to the table. We all had seen, like, all the Star Trek films. We all knew what it was to be in Starfleet. We all knew what it was to, like, boldly go, that kind of stuff. But we came, like, like <laughs> Hector had only seen the J.J. Abrams films and was working his way backwards. And then my, my, my star player, Sam, was convinced that Starfleet was a military and, and like, <laughs> and, which is like, to me, I'm like, no, Roddenberry says it wasn't. Like, like it was this, it was, it was funny because we were like 10 episodes in and we could see the wheel just wobbling. But, but the, the, the funny thing about that was, is I gave my players a tool because it, it, nothing was playing like I had originally planned in, in S.H.I.E.L.D. Like when we started that show, like it, everyone struggled with the rank structure. Everyone struggled with the idea. We never really checked in to, to see if we had a unified vision of how this game was going to present. But the funny thing was, is, is even though Matt was right, <coughs> even though that, that happened, that failure converted into compelling gaming because I gave the players a simple tool of just whatever happens, no matter what happens or where your character goes, just stay committed to each other. And let it be true that no matter what happens, this is your crew and you have to have each other's back. So if you've got a problem with another player, then, or if, if your character has another pl a problem with another character, then you have, to, you have to speak to that character and then take it to the captain. Or you, know, you have to keep it in that game, unless there's a problem with the player and then come talk to me. Um, but what was, what was fascinating was is that failure, that, that, that failure to meet that expectation, ended up turning this, this group of ragtag uh, players who had different ideas of what Starfleet was into a really compelling bridge crew that was all trying to find out as they played what it meant to be in Starfleet. Mm -hmm. And so by episode 15, we discovered that we were, these characters had taken a life that none of us could have predicted. Um, there's something really to be said to committing to a failure <laughs> as, as you're experiencing in the game. Just being, just so long as you take care of each other, a story will get told and it will tell, sometimes it can tell a better story than you ever expected it to. I, I'm totally blanking on Okay. <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> I'm totally one. fine. Yeah, I've got a similar one. The, like, learning how to fail as somebody who's running a game is really, really, really hard. Um, so I'm, I'm running my first LARP. Uh, I've played in plenty and I've run lots of tabletop games, but running a LARP is such a different beast than a tabletop game. Because unlike a tabletop where you all have a group of characters and they're kind of generally all doing the same thing at the same time and generally want to work together. In a LARP, everyone wants to be the main character. And you've got 40, 45 players who all want to be the main character, all want the most screen time, and all want your attention. So you want to, you have to try and please everybody, which is impossible. It's completely impossible. Everyone's going to talk behind your back about how, oh, they made this rule call that I don't agree with, or no, my character's not getting as much attention as this other character, or my plots aren't as interesting. And sort of having to learn to embrace the fact that not everyone's going to like this game. I'm going to run it as best as I can and just try and keep it running forwards. That was a really tough thing for me to learn. But I think, I think now the game's running pretty good. <laughs> I, I'm definitely not everyone's happy, but everyone's having fun and no one's quit. So that's as good as I can ask for. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. <laughs> so um, I think my biggest struggle with, back when I was running a D&D game, instead of a, uh, before it was Invisible Sun, I had a player who would consistently, every time he met an NPC, after the PCs left, go back and try and kill him. And sometimes <laughs> would try and kill him before, or in the middle, and was just generally trying to kill everyone instead of engaging with the plot or the other characters. This made the other characters salty. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it also... Uh, Obviously, it was, it was interesting, though, because when I would talk to him, he was really into his character. He was committed. This was what his character would do. And the other players were obviously very committed to trying to actually engage with the plot. And so I had talked with him and talked with him and talked with him about, like, you know, different ways he can express his goal that aren't going to make the other players, like, it, so he could work as a group. And it just wasn't working, and he was getting worse. And the other players kept getting angry and pushing back more. And then I talked to the other players about it and said, you know, um, he's really stressed. He really wants to play his character. He feels like he's getting a lot of pushback. And the next game, there, you know, there was a, there was that opportunity. There was that man. They ran into him. Then uh, everyone was pretty sure that the character was going to kill him. And they're like, you know what? We're just going to walk away, and we're not going to say anything. We won't notice. And then he's like, well, oh, shit, I'm not going to kill him now. <laughs> and he stopped killing people. And then they started working together. And it was one of those things where he was just pushing back against the control, the narrative control that some of the other players were expressing. 
uh, because he felt like he wasn't able to play himself. And so as soon as we actually attacked it from the other angle, instead of the angle of like, well, this is a problem player, but looking at like, why is this situation making him uncomfortable so he acts out in this way, we were able to solve it. And now he's like a great dedicated player in the game who doesn't kill everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that's a great point. I don't know if this totally fits, but I mean, I've only played with my family group, so we don't have like a ton of that. But, you know, if you notice one of the other players really wanting to do something, maybe just take a step back and see where that goes and become like, even if it was your, your moment kind of, but someone else wanted to do something, just take a step back and see where that goes and see if that's something that your character wants to do too. Cool. So, um, you know, one of the things that uh, we talk a lot about in your best game ever uh, is sort of the, the dichotomy, uh, the balance, the conflict between the rules and the story, right? Uh, so what are, what are your feelings uh, about how do, you, how, do you, how do you juggle both of those balls, right? You're, you're, as a group, you're trying to tell a story, but you've also got these rules, and sometimes the rules help, Sometimes they hurt. Uh, 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 Elena, why don't we yeah. start with you? I'm a, I'm a real loosey-goosey kind of GM. <laughs> <laughs> I will make up rules on the fly, I will change rules on the fly, and I had to be like really upfront with my uh, gaming group, and I'll be like, okay, look, anything kind of goes at my table, that goes for you as well. If you pitch me something and I think it's cool, I might let it happen. Uh, but I will also, at some point, be like, no, we've gone too far with it, and I know we used to do it that way, but I don't want to do it that way anymore, or I don't want to do it this time. So I'm very inconsistent as a GM, uh, and I'm definitely one of the people who's more willing to sort of put the story over the rules, but I've written myself into corners that way before too. So I, I need some reins, and I think the rules are a good reins. It's, it's a good way to keep everything in the world consistent, so you can't break them too much, or you risk having to sort of go back on yourself and go, okay, yeah, I was running it this way before, but now we have to do it this other way, and I might change my mind again, and no one remembers how the rules work now. <laughs> <laughs> Quick follow-up question for you. So yeah. how did you get your group to that point where they were like, oh, okay, uh, we're gonna just go with, with whatever you say, right? And even yeah. if it's that, that's against the rules, or, or you know, you ruled that way yeah. differently two weeks ago, how did you get into that space? Because that's a great yeah. space to be. Partially, I handpicked my group. Mm -hmm. So it was a bunch of people who I knew from LARPs, who I knew were real sort of improv -y, sort of anything goes people. But then I sat them down at first and I was like, okay, here are the options for games I'm willing to run, and here's how I would run each of these. Uh, let's talk about which one we all wanna play as a group. Uh, and then I'll talk to you about how I would run that and like just lay my cards all out on the table. Cool. Susan, do you have? Uh, yeah, um, I think that for me, I like to try and get the soul of the game. Mm. So I try and internalize the rules and it's kind of like, you know, you look at biology and if you think about it, if you study it, if you look at the patterns, there's always an underlying pattern. And once you have the soul, the underlying pattern of the game, then you can kind of go by the underlying pattern instead of the exact rules when it benefits story. I will always, if there is a moment where you have to choose between rules and story and the story would just be dumb if you follow the rules, you'd always go with story. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, I also have half primary, like people who started in video gaming and they really like it fair. And yeah. so I try and give yeah. the spirit of the rules, the feeling of the rules for the most part going forward. And then if it's dumb story wise, we break the rules. We also have a die, we call the die of fate, where if it's on the border for uh, whether they break the rules or not, we roll it, and if it's high, we adhere to the rule, and if it's low, we don't, and we let the player who's making that choice roll it. Okay, cool. and so that's, that's how, cool. is that how you got the, the rules, or the more rules conscious players to kind of go along with it was, you, you made control. a rule. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, Vicky, how about you? I think uh, Magnus, my dungeon master in the game, uh, Dean Dagos, he would definitely say that, you know, the rule of cool. <laughs> you know, the if it's fun, cool. if it's fun, something to do, go for it. You know, keep the rules kind of light. They're definitely there for a reason. But, you know, if you're having fun, I think that's, I think that's the biggest part of it, is you gotta have fun at the table. Yeah. And if a player's not having fun because the rules are like bogging them down, then maybe, you know, reel that back a little bit. Yeah. How about you, Eric? How do you juggle these balls? <laughs> it's it's interesting because I, I as I'm sitting here thinking about it, I realize that uh, the the past three campaigns I have played, 
uh, from Callisto to, to S.H.I.E.L.D. to Doctor Who, they've all utilized a, a story mechanic that allows you to spend story points to enact your will upon the narrative. So uh, it, it, there's, there's always been a part of me that I, like for, I, always, I just love it when the RPGs come with something that empowers the player to uh, take control of the narrative for a second, because then we can enter into negotiation and make what they want happen. Mm. Um, I, it's weird because there's a part of me that really functions like, no, we should, really, we should ride close to the rules. That way there's a sense of accomplishment when their character like, that they've built has pulled off something on a roll. But on the other hand, it's like, uh, you know, there's, there's this great mechanic. I love this mechanic so much. It was from the Buffy the Vampire Slayer RPG. Um, and they used story points. And there was, there was this ability that the non-slayer could use uh, where you could spend a bunch of story points to, to <laughs> enact an ability called, I think I'm okay. <laughs> and it was like a quote from Xander from, from Buffy, right? And that's like you get full on decked by a vampire who could, you know, dent a car, yeah. but you spend five story points, you only take half damage. <laughs> so I think I'm all right. I think I'm all right. And, and I loved that because it adds a cinematic quality to an RPG, which I think, I mean, a lot of us are coming into this because we want to have those moments where we say, um, yeah, I am Iron Man, and then kill Thanos. Yeah. Um, but like what I what I love about what I love about um, those mechanics is they allow they, they it's a rule like it's it's like the the die that she was talking about it, it's it's a rule that enacts that you can empower the player to to manipulate the narrative without breaking the game but in, in truth really underneath it all um, no matter what kind of rules that you get set up with you will find after a lot of gaming at the end of the day it, it is it absolutely is about story <laughs> it really really is that's kind of a, a because I, I used to be somebody who was really, especially during my 3.5 days, like, mm -hmm. you know, we had to play by yeah. the rules. Um, yeah. Was not as cool as the games that we played where people did crazy stuff like jumping on the back of a fallen lizard man and grabbing up his weapons and attacking the guys next to it. Like, <laughs> where in the rules is that? Like, <laughs> so, uh, but why would, it, why would I rob that moment from a player? Oh, yeah. Like, how cool. Like, give, give a small, mod like, a little bit of a modifier. Give, give like a negative two to that attack, but then give them a freaking inspiration point for yeah. doing it, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, like, actually, if I can jump in for a second, I, I hacked in inspiration points into my 5e game that I'm running currently. Yeah. So I have these uh, white tokens and black tokens, and every game everyone gets a white token, uh, and it refreshes at the, ne at the next game, and you can spend that to just win one challenge. So if it's like, That's cool. I, I need to punch this bad guy, you go ahead, you do it. Uh, and then I have a black token, which is uh, for a bigger, you can actually take control of the scene for a moment. Mm -hmm. But then you give it to me, the DM, and I get to use it against you at some point. <laughs> uh, and you don't earn another one until you do something that like moves the story forward or have a, like, a big emotional moment for your character or, or uh, just something I think is especially cool mm -hmm. and I'll award you your, your black token back. Yeah. And that's been really good for making like big story moments happen in a game that can be very sort of controlled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I dig that kind of negotiation yeah. uh, aspect. Cypher system, just to be blunt, has a great system mechanic where, as a GM, you can just step in and screw somebody over. But <laughs> the player can say, no, you don't, and spend an XP to like reject you, basically. Or they can take this juicy character moment and gain XP from it, which I love. Because, uh, like I said, at my table, Sam, they just... they. They will never reject a GM intrusion. They they want me to drag their character. <laughs> they want me to like bring out the big guns and make their life miserable. And wow. as a result, they have accumulated all of this XP and is like mega powerful now. Sometimes though, the but, yeah. misery is part of the best part of the yeah, game. Yeah, it kind of is. So yeah. yeah. As you can imagine, I've run a lot of Cypher System. <laughs> yeah. And never ever have I seen anyone use the mechanic of I refuse. I refuse? Yeah. <laughs> I've only seen it once. I've only seen it once. It's, and it's only because Gina DeVivo has become a little paranoid about me. And so I'm like, I'm going to do a... Because she was infiltrating this, 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 this organization and she had shapeshifted and she's like, she was, she was in the middle of her dialogue and I just go, I'm going to go at GM Intrusion. And she goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> Spit the XP and said, no, 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 no. Only time it's ever happened. All right, all you story-loving people, then. Um, I'm going to play devil's advocate. And it really is a devil's advocate position, because I'm on your side. <laughs> um, but, but really, the, one of the things that you have to think about, if you, know, if you are, you know, oh, we're going to use the rule of cool. We're going we're gonna, to uh, uh, you know, focus on the story more than the mechanics and whatnot. Sometimes players will start to feel like 
oh, there's no really a challenge here, right? There's training wheels on this game, right? Mm -hmm. The GM's not really going to let us fail. So how do you how do you deal with that? How do you make story come first, but but still make people feel challenged and like and maybe more importantly than feeling challenged feeling like they've really accomplished something when they do succeed and it wasn't just handed to them hmm. Can I start? sure so i do have very paranoid players <laughs> um and so they do start with a certain amount of she's totally gonna kill us i never killed them <laughs> <laughs> the game though but like i think that the thing that i do that freaks them out is i use a lot of atmosphere and so i like, I, do, I will describe things, I will give specific details that are creepy. And this one game, there was a room, they were trying to escape this place, and they found this room, and it was empty, and there was a chair. And the chair, they got closer, and it had some bindings on it. And there was some wood splintered, and there was a fingernail. And then they left. <laughs> and like, <laughs> it was like, it's one, of those, <laughs> it's one of those things where I feel like if you use, and then like I, I had them go into, they were going into this place and like suddenly um, it got more humid and then the flies started dropping and then like as they go you just add details and then they get anxious and this is maybe why they think I'm going to kill them all the time. But, <laughs> but I found that using the power of description to make, to make people invested really has helped me keep them engaged. And they've always kept that fear probably more than they should. So maybe I should dial back the fingernails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, know, I, like, I like tense moments like that, like tense creepy yeah. moments. So like I will, despite being a fairly nice DM and not wanting to kill off my characters, I'm willing to- seriously. Yeah, <laughs> uh, okay, because I've added ways for them to have it out. So like you could spend your, your black mm -hmm. token to just get out of death if you needed to. Um, but I like bringing it up to the points where that's that's an option. So like, you, this could be a total part of kill if, if it went badly. And then give them a way out, or have them find a way out, and then be like, yes, you do that. <laughs> you find a way out of this horrible, impossible situation I've put you in. Because I think you need that, you need the tension there to drive the story. Yeah, I think that, I think that that's great. Like, it's not always just about, oh, here's a big monster, fight it, you know, you're just going to grind against this monster over and over, but like something else, like a puzzle or a challenge or some shadows that were attacking my character recently that kept bringing my uh, strength down, and I just learned the other day that if it goes to zero, I die. Hey, <laughs> learned that at the table. <laughs> so, you know, so that's a little bit more challenging, and something like that, keep, keep the players on the toes with that. I ran into this problem very recently. Actually, we were we were uh, we were playing. So I was I was part of this event, D and D in a castle in the UK, and I got really ambitious and decided to run an old TSR module that had been adapted for Five E called Council of Worms, and it it is uh, not too yeah. Some folks have heard of it, but it's it was one of the last modules that TSR published before uh, Wizards gobbled them up. Um, but uh, Council of Worms allows players to play dragons in D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. It was this whole world that they built, and it, it was kooky. Like, it was vastly overpowered and a little broken. Um, but somebody, a, a developer from Elder Scrolls Online, who wants to remain anonymous, uh, <laughs> brought it up and converted it to 5e, and I was like, I'm gonna run that in, in, when I go to the UK. So um, I, I knew that the player was gonna be a little more powerful, so I started having to be really mindful of how challenging the game was gonna be. Because even though they were dragons hatching out of the eggs, they were still more powerful than a standard first level character. Um, this game spanned like 600 years of game time because we had to play it over three days. So the final game, they were 20th level ancient dragons fighting a demon prince. <laughs> so it's the most mind-blowingly epic finale that I've ever had to a game. But I wanted to give them a very special experience. And what I discovered was is the most powerful creep, right up to the Tarask in the GM's, in, in, the, in the Monster's Manual, nothing can withstand a party of six 20th level ancient dragons. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. Um, I, 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 I kept, uh, I started realizing that they were going to stomp face. Like, round two, I was like, oh boy, <laughs> this is gonna be a real fast fight. So I started, this is, this is, this is a glimpse behind my GM screen because I, this is something that's a little controversial, but I realized on the spot, they're not gonna get a gaming experience if I don't do something about this. Yeah. Um, we've been building up to this fight, and if, if like, I don't want I never want to rob players of something spectacular. I've seen a ranger in my party 
one hit a Demi Lich with a Mace of Disruption on a 1 in 100 chance killed the villain of our campaign in one hit. It was hilarious, and our GM was angry, but we as the players were hysterical with laughter and we enjoyed it. So I was at this game, and I'm running this with these dragons, and I basically started realizing in-game I needed to keep upgrading this villain as we played. So I decided to give the villain a second form, like Final Fantasy style, like, oh, no, I'm even bigger now. So like, um, and, and that's what I did, and, and like, and they continued to stomp face. <laughs> like, turns out, six flying dragons that can throw down ninth level spells and use breath weapons is, yeah. So I, 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 I get, by the end, I had taken the Demon Prince Orcus and Tiamat and put them together <laughs> to create this ridiculous monster that they all fought. And the game lasted six hours. And in all honesty, guys, like that ridiculous monster barely hurt them. <laughs> um, uh, one of my players took a meteor swarm to the back. Okay. <laughs> it was absurd. And at the end of the game, they had had the time of their life. They felt like they had just engaged in a world-shaping event. They were dragons. Like, they were meant to establish this new empire. I had been afraid as a GM that I was not supplying efficient challenge. That the rules were, I mean, the rules could not help me here. We were way off the map. Um, <laughs> And I had been concerned that I was going to run into a player who was going to have a problem with that because nothing could help that. And I, I just discovered that just keep just keep checking in and and just keep just I just I love going the cinematic route and just making everyone feel like the battle's getting desperate, but you know they're still in this fight. At the end of the game, I discovered that it it doesn't matter. They they had the time of their life. They could not stop talking about. It. I get emails from them. Uh, weeks later talking about they're, they're still in contact with each other they started their own discord chat called the airy because that's where the dragons nested <laughs> and they just keep talking about that last game um uh, i i would just say uh i mean it's kind of it's kind of like going against the the, the question the devil's advocate question but it's it, it's again like at the end of the day through the other side of the player who's concerned about the rules it's still about story at the end of the day especially if you're doing theater of the mind i've yeah. discovered that that's the case yeah, I've never, I, I, I struggle when GMs come to me and they say, what am I going to do about my players because they just kill everything that I throw at them. And I, I just want to say, you know that numbers just get bigger, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, if, if they're just always hitting armor class 30, there's an armor class 35, you know. Um, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> it's okay, it's budget where you're like, you don't see what I'm rolling. Yeah. Right. I, I'm, right. Maybe I'm rolling twenty. Those players here. did yep. not know <laughs> that you, in your notes it didn't say. And after they kill him, then he transforms into an even. Right. They didn't, they didn't yeah. know. And 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 they're be the better for it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I have one additional note if mm -hmm. I can. Um, one thing I noticed as a player in particular is that even if like Invisible Sun, death isn't super a problem uh, because you can continue. But I'm really paranoid about my friends and people I like getting hurt. Not, not mm -hmm. the players, mm -hmm. but like if there is an NPC that is cool or cute or amazing, I am like, no, you you mm -hmm. cannot get hurt. I will protect you. And like I will get so <laughs> paranoid about that. I fall in love with so many NPCs. Yeah. Like, just mm -hmm. platonically, like, oh my god, you're yeah. so cute. And okay. <laughs> <laughs> heaven forfend at me when touch a hair on this talking mushroom's head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is uh... That is such a useful tool in the GM's toolbox, and that is the NPC that everyone loves, mm -hmm. right? Because <laughs> you can you can have and and you know if there's something that you don't want the players to do or you want it to make it difficult for them, um, this actually came up just in our Invisible Sun game recently, right? You know you could have a big mean NPC come in and say if you do that thing I'm gonna kill you, right? And that probably won't work. Um, but if you have a, an NPC that everyone loves, and they say, oh, I really hope you don't do that, <laughs> they're not going to do it. And yeah. it's such a useful tool. Yeah. <laughs> or the hidden relationships. We just had a, a big plot line come together in one of our games where they'd been fighting this, the, hunting this monster for a really long time called the Grendel. Uh, and they were like, okay, well, we gotta, we gotta kill it, we gotta kill it. They didn't really have a reason to kill it, other than that's the most easy way to deal with it. Uh, and so they're <laughs> in the fight, and they're killing it, and, and we go, okay, fate point, it's dying. And it turns back into your brother. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Bummer. 
Great. Uh, super great. And then they discover this whole backstory about how a wizard had imprisoned him as the monster and he'd done these terrible things to deserve it. But it was a, it was a great moment and they were all like just flabbergasted by that. Mm. Yeah. I have had my life threatened if an NPC that, that my characters love dies or if anything happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, and yeah. that is what happened to our party is I had convinced uh, two characters like goblinoids that were supposed to, we were probably supposed to just kill them and break into a cave. I, I play a tabaxi Linus, and the big goblin guy fell like in love with me because kitty kitty, you know. <laughs> and I convinced him to help us get this magical hammer, which I didn't know at the time was magical, uh, to give to someone else in in exchange for a reward. Uh, the hammer animated in his hands and killed him, and we still lament that. And it's been like a year and a half. <laughs> 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 Hmm. Well, we've got uh, just about maybe 10 minutes left. Um, what questions do you guys have for this panel of gaming experts up here? Yeah. Hi, um, you guys spoke about your best you know, games ever. Could you touch on your worst GMing experiences and what did you learn from that? Uh, I, I, can, I, I, I have one I go to every time I'm asked that question. Um, and it's it's pretty it's this is it's a story that this was a moment that I was pl I was a player in this game, but our 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 GM without any notice checking in with any player decided that rape was okay to put in the game, oh. um, and it was my character that was going to get involved with that, mm -hmm. and and that was up until that point I had not been involved in a game where communication like we were still kind of coming out of high school so we had no idea we were kind of like oh what's communication like we're all on the same page nobody wanted to play that game again after that night um, it was yeah. definitely the worst game um, experience because the GM refused to listen to the concerns of the player that night yeah um, we didn't even finish the game we we were just like which which led to a lot of friend tension um, yeah. it's really all of that could have been avoided if there had been a conversation. All of it. Mm -hmm. We had a great campaign going, and then all of a sudden, it was like someone threw a baseball through a window. And mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I mean, everyone will tell you that communication is so vital, and especially establishing boundaries and caring for each other. That that was a huge violation of trust, and and none of us were cool with it. Mm -hmm. So, um, that was definitely by far. Yeah. Not sorry, it wasn't a funny story. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good lesson, though. Yeah. yeah. Same thing actually happened to me, uh, and again, my yeah. character, and I actually walked out. I yeah. tried. To, I, I was like, this is not okay, he's like, right. I don't understand why, and I was like, fine, I'm out. You yeah. don't understand, I can't. Yeah. 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 It was just, never played with them again. Yep. Yeah. yep. Uh, I had a terrible confluence of, that's what my character would do, and well, that's what the players want in a LARP once, where uh, there was this great character everyone loved, he was uh, uh, just a great character, uh, and somebody went, well, my character would try and kill this guy because everyone loves him. Uh, and the DM was like, well, if that's what the player wants, I'll run a combat scene between you. Uh, this great character ended up getting staked, taken out to the sunlight, and just left uh, there by some ghouls during the day. And everyone was, even the DM and the player who was doing it was, were like, oh, we don't want this to happen. But it's what my character would do. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it wrecked the game. Uh, there, are, there are a few phrases that have the potential for wrecking the game more than, well, that's what my character yeah. would do. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah. yeah. I don't really have an answer to that. Since I haven't <laughs> run a game, so I guess I guess it's that I haven't run a game yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what sorts of things do you feel are most important to take care of? What sorts of things should a GM be prepared for in a session zero, like uh, particularly with a new system that no one's played in the group? I think you need to understand your players, what they want from the game, and you need to understand their characters. Not understanding what their characters want and what the player wants means that you have no idea what you are doing for that person. Uh, uh, we've, we've had to do this a couple of times now on uh, GNS because uh, a few of the people that started with our group had never role played. Like Eliza mm -hmm. is a brilliant improvisational actress. She had never role played before and I had to teach her Star Trek adventures and that is not a rules light system. Mm -hmm. um, that is a messy system. And uh, so. Uh, what I discovered in a session zero is not only is it important um, to sort of build those relationships between characters, but uh, always check in to make sure no one's being too intimidated by the rules, because that'll the player check out so fast if they mm -hmm. feel like they're if a player feels stupid. I mean, yeah. I have ADHD, and and I, I remember like training for jobs or being taught rules just goes one ear out the other. I'm I'm too worried about looking stupid and thus not taking in the information. I've seen that happen so many times when you're trying to teach people new rule systems. 
So um, in session zeros, I always I try to keep that. I try to in, immediately in rules in, in session zero make everyone realize that we're all learning together, right. and just sort of yeah. like open that up, and so no one feels like a fool. That's yeah. I think a, a really important bonding experience in a session zero for mm -hmm. the players. Yeah. I think something off of that too is like even just having seven different dice, if you have a brand new player who's never seen all the dice, just separate out the ones that they're actually going to need. If you're only gonna need a D20 and like a D6 or something, just put those, you know, hide the other dice away. You don't even <laughs> need to worry about that. Just have the ones out that you really do need. It's gonna be less confusing. It's gonna make you feel a little bit more comfortable at the table. I think my biggest one is related to yours, which is that I realized that when, someone, when people are asking questions, or can they do something, can they do not, and you've got like usually five people telling you questions at once, and as it, it can get very overwhelming, and mm. it can be easy to go into just answering per the rules, mm. like, oh, this, oh, this, oh, this, as people are asking questions, but I found it very important not to say no, um, and instead, if they were looking for something, to say, these are ways you can do that, and to not answer until I could say that. Because I found that saying no really can shut down character people, not just mm. characters, when they're learning a new system, and it made them feel dumb, mm. and it made them feel it can make them feel like uh, maybe they shouldn't try this new game. So if you're yeah. just if you're giving them options and opening their world oh. instead, and if you're new to gaming, there's so much jargon. Yeah. Like even that can just get confusing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, this book uh, opens up with all those all those yeah. terms that we just throw out all yeah, the yeah. time, right? That uh, that you know somebody new just has no idea. TPK, what is you know, you know that kind of stuff. Oh, my, my very first game I ever played was a LARP, where I showed up uh, and it was supposed to be set in London during the Blitz, uh, and I'd been told, okay, you're playing an artist, you're playing like a jazz artist, show up, great. And I got my character sheet and I was like, whoa, what the heck is this? And they had to. And so the person who was trying to explain my sheet to me got like, so deep in the jargon, I almost left. Oh, right, right. Mm -hmm. And then somebody else came and took my character sheet, went, took one look at it and went, you're a Toreador, so you're an artist, and you're very fast. <laughs> and I went, great, that's all I need to know. <laughs> one other thing I did is I did independent sessions with characters, people who were particularly nervous. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, that's that's something that I picked up because uh, when my friend Mercer was he was starting Critical Role Campaign Two, I was asking him like, so these are people that have that have really gotten into playing with each other. Now y'all are starting a, a whole new campaign. Like the pressure is on. How are you gonna to do that? And he that's what he did. He took everyone and individually did session zeros with everybody. Um, and I have done it ever since, just like that mm -hmm. too, with with the exception of Gina and Sam because they refuse to be separated. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, uh, yeah, I, I think session zeros individually is really fun, yeah, and I then and then giving everyone a through th a through line where they can all connect mm -hmm. and like discover each other in mm -hmm. in game one. They're just like, oh yeah, me too. Like, um, I find that that's a good bonding experience. Yeah, I would just add, um, you know, if the whole group is new to the game. Uh, we always put it on the GM to be the one who knows the rules and, and sort of masters the rules. Um, it doesn't have to be that way, right? Uh, it's it's okay, you know, find an ally, right, in the group who is, you know, gonna be really into the rules once they learn, and have them also really learn the rules. And then, you know, you can take on the role, the other parts of the role of, of GM, and they can answer a lot of those basic rules questions. How do I do my stats or whatever? Um, and and then suddenly it's not you teaching. You know, it's it, it 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 can set up a weird adversarial relationship. I think if it, if the players all feel like the GM is the only one who knows how to play mm -hmm. this game. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you can if you can push that aside a little bit um, and push that onto someone else, then that will go away. Mm -hmm. Who else has a question? Yeah, right in front. Um, your favorite puzzle or track mechanic? Um, something specifically that might have helped like the narrative in a, a good way or maybe help the party coalesce? I think the easiest solution, where I will make a puzzle that has no solution and put it in front of the people, and then if they come up with something cool, I'll be like, that was it all along, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and I never told them that. <laughs> so that's cool that's actually I had pretty planned. solid. Yeah. 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 I have one puzzle. Mm -hmm. So um, this is probably more than you want to do, but I made out of clay a, uh, <laughs> I made a labyrinth, and then I deconstructed some glow sticks of different colors, and then I took some other liquids like, you know, that don't react with the glow stick chemicals, make sure you get that. Uh, and then they had to mix alchemy potions in order to like make this potion. So when it, they came time to do that, I put it out on the board, 
and if they follow, solve the riddle correctly to pour the correct parts, the whole thing lit up because the, the pieces from the labyrinth would go to the center and it would light up. Oh, wow. And they really liked that. <laughs> There's two types of GMs. <laughs> Doing crayons would be a big deal for yeah. me. <laughs> but anything in a science book, like there's also the iodine clock, and there's so many different like basic science things you can do with kids that will look magical and take seconds without the clay thing. You can do it without the clay. You can have them mix so it cool in a beaker. That's so yeah. immersive. Like, oh, yeah. and hands on. Really cool. uh -huh. I love that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, how do you guys, or do you guys ever have like an NPC who is like important and you want people to like them, but uh, it, it seems like players seem to attach more to the NPCs who are kind of like the least important? Because you can kind of just make them a short character where they don't need to have like a backstory. So, yeah. how do you guys make important NPCs as, as likable as the ones that you barely see? I move the goalpost. Yes. So if there's if there's an NPC that they love, that's the important NPC. Okay. If there's someone I had that was important, or a plot line, if there was a plot line that was important that no one cares about, it's not important anymore. Mm -hmm. Or I'll move it over here and now it's attached to this. It's true. That's 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 solid because yeah. you you can't it is such a variable predicting who they're going to like and dislike. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I pulled from the cipher book, I pulled Frankenstein's monster and created a character that was going to be the, the boss fight of one of the games. And, and, and it was going to be this, this huge opening door moment where they realized, oh my god, they're genetically engineering these bad people or whatever. And they ended up befriending him. <laughs> and now he lives in their base under the ocean, and his name is Sal, and he wears, and he wears a yellow raincoat and he serves coffee. <laughs> and so I, I can't deprive them of that. I, that's the one I get threatened on. Like, I can't let anything happen to Sal or I'm going to die. Yeah. But, but there are other NPCs that I've tried to introduce that they just full on, like, oh my god, like swearing at the table every time his name is mentioned. Like, we'll reject him. I've had to shift it. It's that's the, the I think that's the right approach. Yeah. You, you just have to think on your toes at that point. I think uh, my dungeon master, we are gonna latch on to any NPC that he does a fun voice for. Like that's the one. <laughs> that's that's right. guy. That's Can true. you come with us now? Yeah, right. Like it just it has a funny voice now. We love him. Can he come with us? Yeah, like, yeah, that's you know, solid. Too. Like, <laughs> yeah, in a in a three E game run by Chris Perkins, I uh, he had like the mic in it. You know the mushroom people. Mm -hmm. They, they all talked in this really funny voice straining kind of, <laughs> right? And so we just kept going back to talk to them just as we wanted him to make the voice. <laughs> oh my God, that's yeah. great. Did you have something to add? I pretty much agree. I totally, I just, and it's so funny because whenever I design a character that they're supposed to interact with in some way, they will go off the rails. But if I lean into it, that's the other thing. You lean into the incorrect assumption, it can be really fun. Mm -hmm. So like I created this character and he really rubbed this one character wrong, so they decided he was a pickup artist. So I was like, great, pickup artist. That's a, a great side character I can use. And they hated him. And then I made it so they had to save him, and it was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because they didn't want to, but they wanted to because they were moral people, and it created this like moral conundrum. And But like, he was just supposed to be some side character who had a clue they had, right? Um, yeah. So I'm going to interject a plug um, <laughs> because... Uh, so we, we produce adventures in this format called Instant Adventures, and they are basically, they use this model. Um, and the idea here is, is that they require no prep. You can, in the, in the time that the players kind of get their pre-generated characters, you can skim the first couple of paragraphs of the adventure and then run the adventure. And the way that that is accomplished is, is that we just tell you, okay, so at some point in this adventure, somebody's gotta tell the players this, They've got to find a key that will open up the door, and they have to, you know, find, you know, a weapon that will that will kill the monster, and and then the text of the adventure, you know, every one of those things could be everywhere, right? And so if you want the adventure, if you want the information, you know, thing to be in this encounter, then it's this fellow, right? But if you don't want it to be here and they go into the next room, then it's then it, the information is, you know, hidden in this statue or whatever, right? Um, and I think that that is absolutely the best and easiest way to run adventures is, is, is because, you know, as everyone said, right, it, players are going to seize on something and it might not even be an NPC, right? It might be like, 
I'm sure that the hidden door is in this room, and so we're just gonna keep searching here. No, it's really not. Yes, but we're gonna keep, oh, uh, behind the statue, right? No, really, you don't find anything. You know, players just get that headcanon of what they think is going to be the case, and, <laughs> and then they just keep beating their heads on that particular wall. And so the more you can do to circumvent it, right? Because the right answer really is, Oh, yeah, the secret door is behind the statue, right? Because they don't know. Yeah. Well, sometimes they get mad if it's not there. Right. Yeah. They figured it out. Yeah, that's right. Clearly, all the clues pointed to behind the statue. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> cool. Uh, let's take one more question, and then we probably better get out of here. Okay. Well, uh, one, why you gotta attack my players like that. <laughs> 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 To all of the advice that you guys have talked about, um, it's phenomenal, of course, especially for campaigns. Is there anything for conventions specifically? Oh, nice that question. Would it be good to bring to the rest of Gen Con, for instance? You mean for just like one shots? Like yeah. What do you you, yeah. you play? You know, it's a really interesting situation, right? It's a one shot game. You're probably playing with strangers. I, yeah. yeah right? I, I've yeah. thought about this because I I've been wanting to run a one shot here at Gen Con, and I don't even know if I can pull it off. But I've been like I'm thinking like. Because my games are very important to have an emotional investment. How do you do that in a one shot? So, what I love to do, um, and, 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 and this is kind of how I had to set up the Council of Worms game in the UK. They had never met before. Um, I I I give them what I like to do. It's kind of cheating, but I'm like, okay, make your characters, but you have to let this be true. You're all from the same village, and you've all heard about this thing, or you've the crops are failing this year, and this is what's at stake. Like, give them that one through line. And then it's, it's amazing watching players discover their relationship as you play. Because the thing is, is really, like, if you can just commit to those imaginary circumstances and stay committed and keep within those boundaries, a story is going to get told no matter what. It doesn't have to be a campaign. You can have the greatest one shot of your life that you're going to be talking about for ages. Um, and I think, I think it, for me, and this is just my particular play style, I, just, I love infusing any like, game with that, just a little bit of that emotionality to, the, to what's going on to the character. Because it just it raises the stakes of everything you're going to do, and that's that's what I like to do for one shots. Yeah. As a player, for me, I think that the thing that uh, I found that helps me have the most fun is to take a personality from like a TV show or a movie or something, and you can really have a stronger personality in a one shot than you can in a campaign, mm. and you just lean into it. And my favorite example is uh, we were playing a horror, like two or three shot. And um, the player decided to be the dude, but also a plumber. And, <laughs> and it was just this great, like, such a strong personality that it was just so easily apparent, easy to play, for him, I assume, easy for him to play. And like, whenever I play, if I embrace like one of those characters, you're just automatically comfortable on one level. One thing that you can also do um, is, is put put some of the onus on the players, right, to get them immediately invested. So, you know, don't s necessarily say, um, you know, the king has commanded you to go do this thing, right? Uh, it's, you've all decided to go do this thing. Why? Why, why are you yeah. going, right? And yeah. suddenly they've got to provide the impetus. Now they're getting in character, and now they are, they are invested in the adventure because they've just told you that they were, right? Mm -hmm. Any other one-shot convention tips? No, that's, that's a good one. All right. Put, put, let them do the work. <laughs> let them do the hard part. And then they, they feel smart about it because they're like, cool, this is why I'm here. This is mm. why I, I want to do this. I am ultimately a lazy oh, GM, so the more <laughs> things I can have the players do, awesome. Can, can, I, yeah. can I just share a quick story? <laughs> it's, it, it, was the, it was the fastest one-shot I've ever played in my life. It was a zombie apocalypse one-shot. And I was and, and I, I was following those rules where we, I'd been given this like this quick uh, character of like okay who are your character and why and so I, I played this this like obnoxious dude who was on we were on a bus the game started with us on a bus during the zombie apocalypse and it was only just starting so uh, my guy was this obnoxious like 
just like every bad like stereotype of like an early 2000s uh, guy who was like really into Nickelback and stuff like that. And we were this bus was proceeding down the road at like 40 miles an hour, and we saw what uh, the 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 GM was telling us that we were seeing a zombie attack, but he didn't describe it that way. It was a fight on the side of the street as we were driving by. So my guy pulls the bus window down and starts going, yeah, like, because, like you say, in a one shot, you get to play those big personalities. And so you make that choice. Um, and then the driver, immediately as I'm screaming this, the driver sees a zombie walking the road, jams hard right, the bus flips, saving throws, I fail, the bus lands on me, smears me across the road, <laughs> killing me instantly. It's a one shot I can't stop talking about. <laughs> Wheezing with laughter. Make big choices like that, it's hilarious. Yeah. I think we need to vacate the room, but thank you guys. Thank you so guys. Much. Check out best game ever. We also have uh, player notebooks and GM notebooks that kind of uh, guide you through some of the steps that you'll find in the book itself. So uh, they're nice companion pieces, all available in the Monty Good Games. Thank you so much. Have a great Jeff.